Where to start? Well, I'm Andrew Hilton, and this is, I think, the 53rd consecutive weekly economic outlook since we, well, that is the UK economy and the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation, went into lockdown. Well, at the time, who could have foreseen that what we initially dismissed as Wuhan flu could have lasted so long or done so much damage economically, socially, and I fear psychologically. Here in the UK, we pumped at least 57 billion pounds of emergency assistance into the economy on top of any other aid. Uh, and God only knows what the opportunity cost of all that has been. Uh, moreover, one way or another, we are going to have to go on paying for this for a generation or more. And of course, Society has suffered. Uh, it's become more and more illiberal, more scared, more angry. And every survey of young people in particular finds that a higher, there is a higher incidence of anomie, of depression, and much less optimism about the future. And of course, we're, we're not shot of the virus yet. True, in the United States, the authorities have, I think, pretty much given up, even, even in New York, uh, despite flare-ups in holiday destinations like Florida. But in Europe, where electorates, I fear, are more passive and polit politics more authoritarian, Germany and France and Belgium and Italy have all impose new lockdowns and as a result of the so-called third wave and, and Mrs. Merkel, uh, who was after all the daughter of a Lutheran pastor, remember that, was only just stopped from cancelling Easter altogether. In uh, secular France, uh, President Macron has no such qualms. More than half the country has been effectively banged up again. The reality, of course, is that uh, we are never never going to eliminate COVID altogether. There'll always be flare-ups as the virus mutates and as people and goods travel around. That's going to generate field day after field day for petty bureaucrats the world over. As I fear we saw last week when someone from whatever Public Health England is called these days warned that social distancing will have to go on forever. On the contrary, the sooner we learn to live with the virus, the better. In the last week, I read that, um, that only about 19 people died of, or that is, I suppose, with coronavirus in the UK last week. That could go up fivefold, and it still wouldn't warrant shutting down the economy again. Oh, well, I hope our Prime Minister gets his libertarian nerve back. Economically, of course, there have been winners during the pandemic. Big Pharma, for instance, Big Tech, uh, logistics company, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, but they are greatly outnumbered by the losers, in particular those who work in the travel and hospitality sectors. What is less obvious is that the biggest winners have tended to be those who already had most in the first place. I have to say that I was astonished to see this week that year on year, the Dow Jones industrial average is up 53%, the S&P 56%, NASDAQ 73%, the DAX, the Zetrodax 53%, the CAC 38%, and even our own dear FTSE 100 up 22%. If you'd had a slice of that, and I guess that almost all of you did, either directly or through pension funds, uh, you've done pretty damn well. So where are we now? Well, in the rarefied world in which professional economists live, the, the continuing debate is whether or when the massive fiscal stimulus and the super accommodating monetary policy stance that we've had over the last year will generate a surge in inflation. The Fed's view, the US Treasury's view, and the view of, I guess, most central banks in most advanced countries on this issue is pretty clear. It comes in two parts. First, there's no sign yet that inflation really is picking up pretty much anywhere, at least at the consumer price level. And second, that even if pressures at the producer price and wholesale price levels do start to come through, and they might, 
We have a lot more to worry about, given that unemployment is probably underreported practically, particularly amongst the uh, poorest and most deprived members of society, which means, of course, those who are most likely to be disruptive. My personal view, for what it's worth, is that it's hard to argue with a 23% year-on-year in U, uh, increase in US M3, and that sooner or later we will see the consumer price index well above the central bank's 2% target. But equally, that's probably a risk worth taking, though uh, the northern nonconformist in me uh, kind of hates to see the astronomic levels of fraud that are associated with all emergency aid and furlough programs, as well as, I think, the fact that, as always, the winners will be those who need it least. And that also goes, I guess, for individual nations. Those who have suffered most and who are now suffering are the poorest countries, not helped, I should add, by India's uh, decision to restrict vaccine exports, uh, since it is the major exporter of vaccines to the Gavi COFAX initiative on which many of the poorest countries rely. That has given some sort of uh, momentum, I guess, to, the pu to a push for a new SDR allocation, which might allow the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, to boost its lending to countries that have been indeed hit hardest, both by the collapse of export markets, which is clearly a problem, and by the drying up of remittances, which may be an even bigger problem. It was apparently agreed last week that the fund's newish managing director, Kristalina Georgieva, will present a formal proposal for a new $650 billion SDR, that special drawing rights allocation to the executive board of the fund in June. Uh, uh, that number was not exactly plucked out of thin air. Um, the US contribution to it will, uh, based on the current shareholdings in the IMF, will be $120 billion, which by no coincidence is the absolute maximum that the Biden administration can, can, can commit the US to without going to Congress for its approval. I realize that the Democrats now control both houses of Congress, and I realize also that the progressives within the Democratic Party are said to control the Democratic agenda. And I have some sympathy with that view, but no matter how woke democratic politicians are, they are not at all keen to boost IMF resources when the beneficiaries will tend to be in countries that they couldn't find on a map. Charity for them begins at home. Still, it's progress, uh, though uh, what would I think be more useful would be to find some way uh, that an SDR allocation would not have to be distributed among IMF members strictly pro rata according to their shareholdings, but could be targeted instead on those countries that need it most without, I should add, jeopardizing in particular the US veto uh, on the executive board. That's been talked about for years and years, but never seems to get any closer. Of course, the fund wasn't the only international organization in the news last week. The OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the so-called Rich Countries Club, uh, got a new secretary general a couple of weeks ago to replace Mexico's Angel Gurria, uh, who's stepping down in June after two terms. He, and I guess that itself is a surprise, is Australia's former finance minister, Matthias Cormann, who defeated Sweden's former EU commissioner, Cecilia Malmström, uh, in a very tight fight. He, that is Cormann, is both interesting and controversial. He's interesting because he was born and brought up in the German-speaking part of Belgium, only splitting to Oz in 1996, despite the fact that English is actually his fourth language. And he's controversial because he was fiercely opposed by the labor unions on account of his allegedly Thatcherite approach to economics, 
and by environmentalists because of his efforts to abolish Australia's Renewable Energy Agency and because of his alleged opposition to carbon trading. I cannot for the life of me understand how he came to defeat Malmstrom. She really must have got up the noses of someone or some people in Brussels. Whatever, Cormann's agenda is going to be dominated, at least for now, by taxation, uh, how to tax free-floating multinationals and what to do about the digital beer moths, the so-called fangs. He will, I assume, also have to worry about trade issues. And there, I hope he will be working closely with uh, Ngozi Okonjo-Iwiala at the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Between the two of them, Coleman and Ngozi, will have a lot on their plates, particularly US efforts to build a coalition of like-minded countries to stand up to China on human rights issues and to uh, deter China's territorial ambitions in the South China Sea and vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, and parallel US efforts to build an alliance against Russia on China. U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken was in Brussels last week pushing for a coordinated travel ban on, on a few, I think half a dozen, named Chinese individuals who are accused of human rights abuses against the Uyghurs. Even though no one senior was sanctioned, these were sort of mid-level bureaucrats, China's response was pretty immediate banning a couple of dozen prominent European critics from uh, Brussels, uh, including MEPs uh, and a few UK MPs, including Ian Duncan Smith and other senior officials, and perhaps more important than that, dropping several big name brands, notably Nike and H&M, Hennessy Moritz, uh, from all Chinese websites. That's going to hurt them. China is quite determined to inflict pain on anyone who chooses to put principle ahead of pragmatism, as Nike is learning. The Russian case is, however, a bit more complicated than that. The US under Biden is, uh, can't, cannot allow itself to be seen by anyone in America as being less antagonistic to Putin's Russia than Trump was, and despite what you might have read, Trump was pretty damn antagonistic. Hence, Washington is still determined, still determined to block completion of Nord Stream 2, the gas pipeline across the Baltic Sea, even though it is now 95% completed. Equally, however, German Chancellor Merkel appears determined to go ahead and to permit completion, if only because increased gas supplies from Russia are offer the only realistic way to meet Germany's energy needs over the next 20 or 30 years, given her ill-conceived decision, which she must regret, to shut down the country's nuclear power program. The US and Germany appear to be heading for a showdown on this at the same sometime between now and June the 2nd, which is when the 90-day US review period mandated by Congress comes to an end and Washington has to decide whether to put up or shut up. And if they do decide to put up, what sort of sanctions it should impose and on whom. I doubt that they will be imposing sanctions on Mrs. Merkel. In the meantime, there's still a sense that the global eco economic recovery is continuing, even though the latest lockdowns in Europe, which were not captured in the flash purchasing managers indices for March, which were released last week, are bound to have an impact, as I fear will the blockage of the Suez Canal by the ever given, though my guess and indeed what I read in the paper today is that this is going to be freed either later today or tomorrow. In the meantime, however, we have learned quite a lot. Um, there are about 300 ships, including around 40 crude carriers that are being blocked. It will take some time to clear them. The real lesson from this sorry affair is uh, that when that we were already starting to realize from the COVID crisis itself and even from the collapse of Greensill Capital, just 
how fragile our global supply chains have become. Even before this, I say, the global automobile industry, for instance, was in disarray because, thanks to a shortage of semiconductor chips caused by the reliance on just a couple of manufacturers in Asia and because of the boom in computer games that accompanied the COVID lockdown. Now we learn that 10 billion dollars a day of Western import, imports pass through the, uh, the choke point of the Suez Canal. Uh, and that with manufacturers relying on just-in-time delivery, there will be a crisis if the canal, or indeed if any other choke point, is not opened within the next few days. Again, this is a lesson that governments will have to learn if they haven't already learned it, even if firms are reluctant to do so. Supply chains in future will have to be shorter, they'll have to be more resilient, and they'll have to be more diverse. Just in time, will have to be replaced by just in case. But let's assume that Boscalis can get the canal moving again within the next 24 hours. What then? Well, in the United States, Biden gave his first press conference last Thursday after 65 days in office, which is a record. He, he also got, in my opinion, an appallingly easy ride from a press corps that is still in the tank for him. However, he did say a couple of, I think, interesting things. First, he expressed support for reforming, or if that's not possible, for eliminating altogether the filibuster. If Republicans try to block the extension of voting rights contained in his tendentiously named For the People Act. Don't be misled. This has little to do with fairness and everything to do with boosting turnout amongst Black and Hispanic voters, even if that provides increased opportunity for large-scale electoral fraud, as it may well. Second, he dumped the immigration problem, and uh, in particular, the chaos on the Mexican border, uh, where 15,000 unaccompanied children are currently being held, and where 10 times that number of Central American adults are pressing for entry onto his vice president, Kamala Harris. I don't suppose she'll thank him for that, but it'll certainly keep her picture on page one and on the uh, primetime television news, what he managed to avoid rather cleverly in this uh, press conference, thanks to a compliant press corps, was any giveaway on how he intends to fund the $3 trillion infrastructure programs he also bigged up, which will apparently cover everything from renewal of roads and bridges to electric vehicle charging stations and nurseries for working mothers. Still, you don't have to be John Maynard Keynes uh, to figure out that it means higher corporation taxes, corporate taxes, and at least a sympathetic hearing for sharply higher taxes on the wealthy, as advocated by Senator Warren in particular. Let's, uh, let's think about who constitutes the wealthy. As for the US economy, the consensus is still that GDP growth this year will be somewhere between six and 8%, which to my mind is astonishing. However, economic releases last week were actually a tad disappointing. True initial jobless claims fell from 781,000 to 664,000, which is still astonishingly high, but it is the lowest weekly level since last April. And true, the final figure for the Michigan Confidence Index, which is closely watched by the markets, for March rose from 76.8 to 84.9. But it was also reported that the Chicago Fed's National Activity Index fell sharply in February, along with new home sales, uh, durable goods orders, personal income, and personal consumption. They were all of them down, and almost all of them were down rather more than the markets had expected. That might seem to take a bit of the heat out of the debate over whether the US economy is in danger of overheating, but it's probably just a blip. Larry Summers, in particular, doesn't like to be contradicted by facts on the ground. Uh, plus, as noted, US equities 
barely paused for breath last week. Indeed, last week, the Dow was up 1.4% and the S&P was up 1.6%, uh, though the tech-heavy NASDAQ did pause for breath, uh, dropping just, admittedly, just 0.6% for the week after a family office run by the controversial alumnus of Julian Robertson's Tiger Fund, Bill Huang, had to, apparently had to dump billions of dollars of worth of shares to meet margin calls. What is perhaps uh, more interesting is the talk of a bubble in US equity markets is getting more and more mainstream with analysts focusing in particular on the alleged overvaluation of the S&P, the S&P 500 currently selling at 3.6 times its historic valuation norms. Tricky area here, it's highly subjective, but there is concern. Possibly even more interesting than that is the US bond market, though that's been sending out a very different message. By and large, yields had been backing up since the turn of the year. However, last week, the 10-year Treasury benchmark yield actually fell, and it fell back from 1.73 to a low of 1.61, which is a big move before closing on Friday at 1.66. Ditto with the long bond, the 30-year yield, it fell from 2.45% to a low of 2.23 before closing at 2.36. I'm really not sure about the significance of this. I never really quite understand the bond market. Was it a blip or was it a slap in the face for Summers and Olivier Blanchard and all the other pessimistic economists? I don't know. What about Europe? Well, the big news last week was that the European Central Bank will increase its bond paying program uh, to 21 billion euros a week in order to, as it said, tame interest rates. And it did seem to have had some success. The 10-year German Bund yield, for instance, fell last week from minus 0.29, 29 basis points, to minus 36 basis points. However, I should add that the UK gilt yield also fell, which does suggest that the rally in bond markets last week was a global phenomenon rather than a result of any kind of ECB action. As for European economic releases, at the Eurozone level, it was reported last week that consumer confidence rose sharply in March. It was also reported that in Germany, the IFO, IFO March survey came in significantly stronger than expected with the business climate index, the expectations index, and the current conditions index all up sharply and more than expensive, more than expected. In addition, GFK, GFK's forward-looking confidence index for April also rose sharply from minus 12.7 to minus 6.2. Elsewhere in the Eurozone, however, data last week was mixed. And says business index, business climate index in France, on the positive side, rose from 90 to 97. And in Italy, Istat's business confidence index was also up, though consumer confidence in Italy fell and fell quite sharply. All in all though, Eurozone economic data last week was generally encouraging, though I should add that predated the latest lockdowns, which will undoubtedly knock some of the stuffing out of the recovery. Here in the UK, last week was, I guess, at best mixed. The, even though I read in today's, that's Monday's FT, that economists are generally looking for a much better first quarter than was first anticipated. On the, first, on the positive side here in the UK, it was reported that the unemployment rate for January fell from 5.1% to 5.0, though I'm not sure one should put too much weight on any employment data at all at the present time, given the distortions. Uh, I note also that the CBI's industrial trends survey came in better than expected and that retail sales were actually up 2.1%. On the other hand, car production was down another 14% year on year in February. Terrific carnage. And the CBI's distributive trade survey was stuck deep in negative territory 
in March at minus 45. That's not good news at all. Um, the government's forecast is still that first quarter GDP here in the UK could fall as much as 4.2%. However, as I said, city estimates are more optimistic, suggesting a drop off only two to two and a half percent, which is presumably one reason why the FTSE 100 actually closed up last week, 0.5 percent. As far as global equities are concerned, the most the worst performer amongst the major markets last week was actually the Japanese, the Japanese Nikkei 225, which was down 2.1 percent, though it's still up 5.151% year on year. That was despite an improvement in Japan's leading economic indicators for January and probably reflects the Bank of Japan's review, recent review of monetary policy, which suggested that the bank may start to push Japanese interest rates up, if only because negative interest rates don't seem to have worked. Looking at the rest of the world, I think one has to say a few words about Turkey, which after all is an applicant state for EU membership, even if its chances of joining are about as good as those of an independent Scotland. In my opinion, both the Turkish economy and the lira are in danger of a Lebanon style or Argentine style, if you prefer, collapse. In this case, it'll be stemming from Erdogan's decision to fire his third notionally independent central bank governor in just two years. The lira is currently trading at around eight to the dollar, better than the 8.4 it hit last Monday, but it will, I fear, be very difficult to hold it there, given that Erdogan's economic philosophy is based on the religious principle that uh, high interest rates are a form of usury and are therefore forbidden. Only one way to go, I fear. What else? Well, in the foreign exchange markets last week was a good one for the dollar, which was up 0.9% on a trade weighted basis, even though it's still down 6% year on year since, since before the pandemic struck. However, in recent weeks, the dollar has been taking second place among the commentariat to the dizzying performance of Bitcoin, which ended the week at $55,640. I remain a Bitcoin skeptic. However, I also know that both City and Morgan Stanley put out research notes last week arguing that it is now an investable asset. City actually went further than that, arguing that it could become, and I quote, the preferred currency for global trade, which sounds completely crazy to me. Still, that ought to be bullish. Fortunately, well, fortunately, at least for, for my sanity, Bank of America has taken another tack, uh, joining those who condemn Bitcoin miners for their environmental impact. According to B of A, the power used by the electric power used by miners is now equivalent to the entire power consumption of the Netherlands, which is even more than other estimates which focused on claims that it was equivalent to the electricity consumption of Chile or New Zealand, the Netherlands now. It'll be France and Germany next. That ought to kill Bitcoin as an investment in this uh, economic, ecologically obsessed time. However, I also learned last week, and this is much more worrying to me, that at current, po current power prices, it is still profitable for miners to dig for Bitcoin at any price above $3,800, which means the market is a long, long way from being dead. Damn. Finally, a word on Brexit, or rather on the anguish negotiations that uh, have been going on under, I should add, not David Pross, but Tim Barrow, a seasoned diplomat, between the UK and the EU on a post-Brexit regime for financial services. I learned to no surprise that over the weekend, the two sides have finally agreed a memorandum of understanding. And, but, and I think this is important, it has nothing to do with granting the UK access to the EU single market. 
It is only an agreement to establish what will be called a joint US, UK, EU financial regulatory forum, a forum where regulators on both sides of the channel can discuss problems as and when they come up. Nothing more than that. Marib McGuinness made it very clear, very, very clear earlier in the week that this in no way should be construed as a step towards a blanket ruling of regulatory equivalence that would restore UK access to the single market. And indeed, I think she went further than that, insisting that the EU now has no plans at all to let the UK back in by the front door, the back door, or the side door. On that less than happy note, I'll end for, for now. I'll skip next Monday if you don't mind, that's a bank holiday. Uh, but thanks for watching and I'll hope to see you again in two weeks time. Many thanks.